The historical truth is that lightning killed more range cowboys than did the six-shooter or the skinning knife. And many more drovers rode their cow ponies onto the afterlife over a bluff in the middle of a stampede than did spill their lifeblood on a dirty saloon floor. Of course, being electrified by a white ball of light on the open plain or drilling your hat into the mud can be explained as God's will. But for those who had their life shortened by a Derringer bullet in the heart is what the Greeks call tragedy. Now tragedy is more often than not brought about by foolish behavior. And as a matter of logic and experience, foolish behavior is often the purview of the young. It was the young that made up the majority of the cowboys pushing longhorns up the trail in the late 19th century. Some were as young as 13 or 14 years. To survive, these kids were quickly hardened by the rugged and dangerous life they endured out of the open country. But when they ventured into the rough and tumble trail towns, they were often as helpless as a new puppy. In those towns, many cattle trailing youngsters deposited their social innocence and some their very lives. Thus nature provided the gravest of tests on the open range, and man did likewise in the towns and cattle camps of the Old West. Rounder relates such a tale of one of the less fortunate young drovers in the story of Little Billy. I tried hard to tell the fellow in the black frock coat that Little Billy was the only name we knew him by. That was the name he provided the day he rode onto the XIT looking for a bunk. He was just a youngster, so the Wranglers stuck him with the nickname of Little Billy. The undertaker, without raising up from his chores, just mumbled something about how Little Billy was not a proper name to bury a man with. So I tried again to explain that there was no other name we knew him by. And if he, in fact, wanted something not proper, it was the kid cowhand lying on his oak door slab with them coppers on his young eyes. Besides that, I said, he would go to the dirt without the least bit of justice having been done in his regard. The little man said there weren't no justice for cowboys anyway, and unkindly told me to leave seven coins in the barber chair out front as I left. He said he needed to finish his chores in peace. I followed the buried man's instructions, but added an extra hard dollar on the pile, hoping that my friend would get a decent send-off. I sure did like that little Billy. We rode the night herd watchers together ever since he signed on, him a-going one way and me the other around the herd. With a sweet voice, he'd sing a verse of an old trail tune to soothe the cattle, and I'd try to answer him in kind. It got so when we'd meet up, I'd tell him a tale about my home on the Stockton Platte, and on the next round, he'd tell me about the Ozark Hills of Missouri. We got to know each other so well that for fun, we'd swap our stories. He'd be me and I'd be him. From time to time, we'd add something a bit stupid just to get a row going. The fact was, it was little Billy who might near lost his own life fishing me out of an angry Canadian river during all the flooding in 87. I'd been another horse head in the trees if it hadn't been for that brave boy. I felt right sick in my gut thinking about the kid cowboy as I shuffled through the dust towards the Shamrock Saloon. Little Billy's big old grin, which covered most of that baby face, would sorely be missed come gathering time in the spring. I slowed up my gait long enough to toss my sidearm over my saddle horn. I sure didn't want to end up like the kid on that oak door slab at the back of the barber shop. I did hanker, though, to see the man who had done such a dishonorable deed, a gambling man who'd killed a kid over a game of cheap cards. 
I suspected the rest of the hands on the XIT wanted a piece of that hombre, but all had agreed to put little Billy to rest before creating a ruckus. But to come face to face with the scoundrel weren't to be. After I'd paid my money for a beer, the saloon keep told me the shooter had figured cowboy trouble was a-coming and had decided that it might be better if he worked his card magic on the west side of the Pecos for a while. The bartender flipped my money into a cigar box and made the point that if I was going to get a look at that gambling man's fast draw, I'd have to do a bit of traveling first. I thought better of that and finished my beer in silence. I tried not to think on the doings to take place with the new day. Come first light, six of us cowhands hoisted the rough box onto the wagon and headed up the hill to the burying spot amongst the sand fleas and the tilted crosses. The formalities didn't take long. There weren't nobody good enough with words in our bunch to mark the day as special. Jake did ask the undertaker if he'd say a word or two, but that man just gruffly waved him off, saying as how he only put him in the box. He didn't do grace. As we finished throwing dirt in the hole, the man we'd paid seven dollars for the final works pulled out a marker from a sack and drove it in the dirt pile with the head of a shovel. The marker weren't nothing but a piece of barn wood with a name and date scratched on it with a skinning knife. It read, William Little, Tascosa, Texas, 1891. I looked hard at the undertaker, but he didn't fix my eye. He just kept mumbling as he pitched his tools into the wagon that little Billy wasn't a proper name to bury a man with. All that next spring while riding Roundup without little Billy, I couldn't quit thinking about the marker on his grave. It appeared to me that it weren't the right thing to do to change a man's name like that on his final resting place. If one of his kin showed up looking for the boy, I thought, they wouldn't even know that it was their blood under their feet. And if they made inquiry with the local range hands, not one of the wranglers would know who William Little was. Of course, the reality being, as likely as not, there wouldn't be no kin coming. Little Billy, like so many cowboys in this country, once taken his leave of this plain, is just a lost soul turning to dust in the West Texas sand. I'll tell you one thing that's a sure bet with any gambling man. I'm without fail going to write my proper name down on a piece of paper and keep it pinned safe in my pocket just in case some quick draw puts an air hole in me. I don't have much in this life, just a good cow pony and a saddle, but I want my real name to mark my spot when I go to the final roundup. And should that old grouchy undertaker in Tascosa be the one to fit me in a box, he'll damn well know what name to carve.